This is the Art Zone. You're tuned to the Art Zone, a video document of art and artists in the Rockford area. This episode, we'll visit Bill Gregg at the New American Theater, take a rock and roll walking tour of the show Knee Jerk with Bob McCauley, and see an art video from our friends at Meet Space. Hi, I'm Doc Slavkowski, and this is the Art Zone. We're coming to you from J.R. Cortman Center for Design downtown in the heart of Rockford's cultural district. In this art zone, we'll talk with Robert McCauley, who curated an art exhibition at the Cortman Gallery entitled Me Jerk, where 10 artists react to the music, persona, and instruments of rock star Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick. We'll hear reactions to the exhibition from Rick Nielsen himself. And then we'll take you into the realm of video art with a segment from Meet Space, hosted by Jim Asbury and Devin Henkel. And now to start things off, we'll have a conversation with William Gregg, producing artistic director at New American Theater. We're on the set of Camping with Henry and Tom at New American Theater, and we're talking with the producing artistic director, yes. William Gregg, but Bill, right? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> um, and you've been now with the theater since what, what date did you start here? September 2nd, 1994. And I guess what I really want to get from you is how's it going? It's going pretty well, actually. I, uh, you know, we're moving forward and uh, I think we're uh, showing uh, our or my or the new uh, leadership's uh, uh, vision for the future of New American Theater. and. Uh, we're certainly enjoying the community as well in the process of doing that. What is your um, most difficult uh, challenge that you have with the theater, do you think? I think the theater with a big T all over the country these days is, uh, is funding for not-for-profit arts organizations. The theater being the most collaborative of all those when you include dance and art museums and, uh, and symphonies and chamber orchestras and other arts groups. But the theater certainly these days is always viewed in two ways. It's either entertainment or it's art and we're trying to bring both of those together at the same time. And that is the challenge. How do you make something incredibly entertaining and remain artistic at the same time. We may have always grappled with this question. I think that every artist sees the world through a pair of eyes that is unique and individual to them. Uh, what they then use to express that uh, interpretation or vision of the world around them are the tools, the plays, uh, the conceptions of those plays and how they're produced. I, coming, uh, I, I having come to Rockford from experiences in Minneapolis and New York and Washington DC and large markets with some very uh, avant-garde European directors is the best way to describe them, Eastern European for that matter, uh, was a little, uh, I think, uh, looking forward to a more traditional approach to doing theater, but at the same time not giving up completely uh, what I had learned from those very uh, insightful Eastern Europeans. What about, what, since you've been here, your um, biggest success, what would you say is that? Making it through the first year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first year uh, coming into this and, and it was, was kind of difficult. One, I wasn't familiar with uh, Rockford, the community itself, the arts community that existed here. I brought with me, you know, 20 years of experience in a lot of venues or a lot of communities that were larger than Rockford. I was really surprised that uh, that a town the size of Rockford would have such a facility. And that's certainly uh, a tribute and a testament to uh, J.R. Sullivan for the blood, sweat and tears that he and another group of people over the years put into having this place be what it is. And I think my responsibility now is as much to that uh, effort and tenacity and, uh, and desire to have this kind of art be in this community. And uh, there's some key individuals who supported him through the years that you know, deserve a lot of credit for that too. So I think that you know, getting through the first year and, and hopefully convincing people that we weren't going to turn it into a dinner theater, which we're not. <laughs> I didn't come to Rockford to do dinner theater. There are bigger dinner theaters in Minneapolis, or you know, if it was dinner theater, there's, there, there are kind of like the acme of dinner theaters somewhere else. 
But in regional theater, I find it is where you make it happen. That's how it started. You know, uh, Guthrie went to Minneapolis, uh, Zelda Chandler went to Washington, other folks went to other cities in the country to get away from Broadway. And uh, these days, I, sometimes I feel like we got to go to the moon <laughs> to, to just do art anymore because we are so affected as a group of people, as a society, by mass marketing, mass media, and what is the biggest hit. It's always been a part of what we've done, but the regional theater movement was founded on doing the classics, doing Shakespeare, doing Shaw, doing truly the things that move our hearts and souls and minds to have an understanding of what we're all about uh, and not just to be entertained and, and allowed to forget about what we're all about. Okay, what's in the future for New American Theater? What would you like to see? Let's say a magic genie appears before you and you, know, you can give us your wish list. Uh, well, obviously, uh, I'd love to have at New American Theater audiences participating here downtown in great numbers with what we do. Well, that's first. Second, if you look at our facility, I'd like for the facility to be fully utilized all the time so that in our small theater downstairs, we're running something, whether it be the cutting edge serious play like a David Mamet Oleana or a very popular cabaret performer performing their one person show in cabaret, which I think is a, an art form in and of itself that we don't see much outside Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and some of the major cities, but a very viable one. And one that you know people like Bernadette Peters participate in, even Dixie Carter does her one woman cabaret show. Uh, so it's a, it's a very viable expression uh, of that. So I would like to see us fully utilizing this space and being active all the time. It's funny, that question was asked me during the interview process here. Uh, if you had the, the theater that you wanted to have, what would it be? And I said, I would like for it to be a theater where we could do everything, where we could do some avant-garde cutting edge. And if there are only what I call the thankful thousand in any community that would come out and see it just because it's theater, then we would be able to provide that for them. But that we also have our plays that speak right to the core and heart of Rockford. The, whatever that Rockford audience is, and I alluded to that earlier, that, that when you get to know a community as an artist, and you have to get to know a community in, in the theater to be able to choose plays, to produce things that will speak to the community without preaching to them, without going over their heads, without condescending to them, without anything. And it's the toughest job that a producing artistic director, an artistic director has in putting together a season. So my wish is that we continue to grow, that we continue to provide opportunities for artists as well as audiences to grow and nurture and to really be what we've always been in the theater, again with a capital T, is a provider of, of windows and doors to an understanding of our human nature, to an understanding of our souls. Uh, we're not necessarily a redemption for that, but we do provide incredible insight and co incredible uh, avenues and means to understand who we are as people. And now let's go across the mall and talk with Robert McCauley at the Cortman Gallery. We're at the Cortman Gallery and we're talking with Robert McCauley, who's a professor, you're on sabbatical at Rockford College, and you're the curator of the exhibition entitled Knee Jerk, which is 10 artists responding to the music, persona, and instruments of Rick Nielsen. Now tell us how you came about this exhibition. Well, it's been a long-standing idea of mine. I uh, have looked at a lot of artists and, and noticed that some respond to mu music in a, in a direct way, and I've noticed that some musicians respond to visual art in a direct way, and uh, uh, the carryover from one media to another has been sort of perplexing to a lot of people for a long time, whether there is some sort of dovetailing. And so I, I look at, looking at some people like uh, David Byrne from Talking Head, um, or uh, Terry Allen, who is a, an artist slash piano player slash music writer. Um, I thought about our own Rick Nielsen, uh, someone who we have actually as an artist in residence, so to speak, here in Rockford, and thought that we, we had a unique experience here, a unique opportunity to take, a, take advantage of Rick. Uh, I had noticed over the years that Rick had been quite involved with visual things. He likes to uh, make or design or surround himself with things that are visually active, much in the way you might expect because of the way his music is. So
So uh, that's sort of how this came about. How did you select the artists that are in the show? Well, you know, I know a lot of artists in the area. And uh, first of all, I thought it had to be regional because Rick is part of the Rockford area. I, although I know a lot of Chicago artists, it didn't seem important to go to Chicago. Secondly, uh, not everyone that I know would seem to respond to this kind of an idea in, in a similar way, or not in a similar way, but say, let's say in a creative way. Not everyone responds to certain kinds of stimulation. So although there are a lot of artists in this town that I respect, uh, it, it wasn't necessarily picking the best artists that I know. I picked artists who I thought could respond to Rick, some of them knowing Rick directly, some of them not perhaps knowing Rick at all, but know the music or maybe even know the music tangentially. Maybe they'll, all they've ever heard is mommy's all right and daddy's all right before they got to turn the radio. Uh, that's okay. I, I think that the spirit of what Rick does is the spirit of what artists do. And that's what I'm looking for is someone or a number of artists who could um, in their own way respond on a, on a similar plane, not necessarily on a direct uh, personal level. Do you think that the artists have captured your essence, your persona? Your... Um, I thought I was nuts till I saw this. Now I'm, it's confirmed. Is there anyone that you, you don't get? <laughs> Any of the pieces that you don't get? <laughs> no, the sad thing is I think I understand all of them <laughs> in, a, in a weird way. Maybe not what the artist was thinking, but who knew what I was thinking, so. How did some of the artists respond when you first asked them about this? Was there any sort of <laughs> shocking reactions or? Well, all the way from pure apoplexy to uh, sure delight. I mean, it, the, and one of the things that I'm excited about is that when you give someone, and, and myself included, when you're, when you're given something that you're unfamiliar with and asked to, to respond or to take the ball and run with it, new things uh, come to you. What do you think of the art? I think it's wonderful. I mean, it's like, uh, I feel pretty, you know, really, for once, I'll be serious for about 10 seconds. Uh, feel pretty humble, you know, like anybody gives enough of a hoot to to do it. And uh, God, plus there's great art, a great artist. And uh, Robert McCauley did a great job. And you guys did a great job. And, and, and all the artists did a great, you know, it's like, uh, what can I say? It's like, I, I wish I could take all these pieces home with me. <laughs> you can. Do you have a, um, a credit card on you? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Did you talk to Rick before doing this, or did you get his permission? Or oh, yeah. did, I, I think you have to. I think uh, someone like Rick, there's a great deal at stake here because his identity also includes uh, Cheap Trick, the band, and we had to be careful not to trespass on that aspect of Rick. This is Rick himself, uh, the work, the guitars, the writing, the music, the image, wearing the cap and all that. Um, I did talk to him about it because the last thing you want to do is to, is to uh, create a great uh, deal of uh, activity around someone who is reticent or perhaps even um, turned off to the idea. Um, the whole point was to more celebrate Rick than it was to uh, perhaps put him on a pedestal in spite of himself. Now, you're, you're a designer yeah. and a musical artist, but have you attempted fine art? <laughs> Uh, I've carried some. <laughs> I've looked at a lot. Uh, no, I'm a, I'm a, uh, back to the original, I'm a knee-jerk artist. I, I, I'm a, I, uh, Robert said I was a, an idiot, savant or something like that. Or, uh, no, I, he forgot the savant, I think it was just the idiot. Uh, you, you know, I, I don't know anything about art, but I, but I know what my eye enjoys. <laughs> Uh, Bob, why don't you give us a, a walk around the gallery here and uh, explain a little bit about sure. the pieces. Sure, can do that. Well, this first piece is by Brent Jones. It's titled Mi Amigo Rick. And uh, as I said earlier, um, some of the artists know Rick quite well and some tangentially. And uh, Brent and Rick have known each other for some time. So the title would give that away, perhaps. In the image, you see a brain, a heart, skeleton with wings, dice and some of the signs or, or signal images that you might expect from someone like Brent who has been influenced by Mexican art but the heart and the head or the brain kind of tell you that there's a some kind of 
tension going on here between what you think and what you feel. And uh, in terms of the wings on the skeleton, uh, it seems angelic. The skeleton may have more of a reference to some of the images Rick has done with the skull sweaters and so on. This ceramic piece is by Lynn Fisher. Uh, it comes apart. The hat comes off and there are small brains inside. It's fairly obvious that the base of the piece is influenced by Rick with the skulls and the, and the checkerboard. The brains, uh, not walnuts, brains, uh, have perhaps, perhaps they're that part of li that Lynn has in her reference to Rick or to some other form uh, than we might know. That is, it's difficult to look for a literal translation of a lot of these pieces. So part of it you may understand, part of it you may not. That may also go for the artist. They may not know exactly why they do what they do. That doesn't make it uh, any less important or any less genuine. The piece on the wall here with the fluorescent light is by John Deal. John has used what appears to be a guitar case as the basis of the foundation for this piece. However, it is just a composite of a number of pieces that resemble the case. But it is a play off of the thing that houses the guitar. Rick's guitars have been such an influence in terms of uh, him collecting these objects. Uh, and in talking to John about this piece, this goes way back to pre-Cheap Trick days when John was listening to uh, the band or the sound under other names. So this piece has a history for John and it's important for him to remember those basic roots of music as coming from Rockford, and that's how he responded to, uh, to Rick's uh, music. Uh, this piece is mine. It's called uh, Shaman's Voice, Origin of the Five Neck. The thing that I was most influenced by, or most affected by, was long ago looking at the guitar collection of Rick's and the idea that he would uh, had design or have a, a five neck guitar I'm intrigued with that. It seems like a chorus of voices. Uh, my own uh, in instrument that I like to, uh, to work around is the violin. Uh, so I'm not going to be so overwhelmed by Rick as to do another five neck guitar. Uh, this is part of me, it's part of him. The shaman's voice refers to that kind of, or the, the, let's say the, uh, the location of sound, where it comes from and why in, in either the voice of someone like Rick or the the voice that he hears in his head when he writes music, or the sound that the violin makes. Where does that come from? It's, it can be as ethereal as it can be mechanical. This piece by Stephen Pitkin, uh, I think, is a, a, has a sort of a raging image from what we all think of as part of Rick, the, uh, the skull, the wings, the guitar, this, this being a hammer guitar. It seems almost like a, a kind of personification of that sound that you hear on stage or part of that performance that you witness if you see a concert in which Rick is performing. Um, I think it has almost a, a kind of Wagner feel to it as well. And one of the things I'm intrigued with is crossover music and the thing that you might interpret from a piece like this beyond it being just from or about Rick Nielsen. Jim Juline has taken the initiative to make his own guitar, a very ambitious project. If, any of you, if anyone knows Rick's, or I'm sorry, Jim's work, then you know that he is a meticulous craftsman and he enjoys making very finely crafted uh, objects. In this case, uh, never having made a guitar, he ventured upon a, a project that he was actually in over his head uh, with for some time. But I think that the workmanship it shows and the craft of it shows and, the, and his finesse and his love of making objects shows it, it becomes almost a fetish or a ritualistic object. And by the way, this is playable. Sherry Rittenhouse has worked uh, using wax and paint on a board. This is called Rick Man. And of course, again, it, like some of these, has a lot of the image that you're familiar with with Rick's... Uh, Oh, his persona, the things that he designs, the things that he wears. And uh, again, Sherry is, has known Rick for some time, and I think there's a, a nice close resemblance or tie between the image that she's conjured up and Rick himself. And I think you'll see that with a lot of these, that 
that venture into that area where they're kind of depicting Rick, but they're not. It's part of them, it's part of Rick. Again, you don't want to look for a literal or a realistic in interpretation. You want to look for as much the voice of the artist as you do the pr presence of Rick. One particular mechanism to facilitate the escape of desire, this is by Matt Herbig. In all the pieces, uh, as I've been trying to explain, there's a range of response, and Matt's work has always been fairly poetic. I, I look at his work, and again, I'm not, I'm not led through it as a storyteller might t take me, but it's more about the poetry of how dissimilar things come together, and the sum ends up to be greater than the parts. If you look at this piece again and try to ferret out what part of that is Rick Nielsen, it might be difficult for you, but that wasn't the point. And most of us who did this project started out, went through a, a range of experiences, um, myself included, where we at first were probably overwhelmed by the project or overwhelmed by Rick or were subdued by him. And eventually uh, you sort of struggle and you fight and the artist comes out at the end. And Matt's piece is a really good example of that. Maggie Tienemann's piece is probably the the epitome of the Rick Nielsen glitz, glamour, pop image with the flashing lights and the checkerboard pattern. It's been painted on plastic. It's called Rockin' Rick from Rockford. The whole thing seems tied into uh, that outward extension of the individual of the star, the rock star. And I, I think that uh, Maggie has really gone an extra mile here in using materials and techniques and processes that she's never been involved with before. And that kind of goes back to this idea about given a new situation, how would each of us respond to that? I happen to know that she's never used flashing lights before. Joan Lee Stasi titled the piece Raising Hell. This piece is actually incomplete as you see it. It was meant to be destroyed. It was meant to be hit with a bat during the opening, but if you've seen either footage of the opening or if you were here that night, you know that hitting the, the glass with a baseball bat could have been uh, problematic. So um, this piece is yet to be uh, performed. Uh, it is a performance drawing. And if you think about that, they almost seem, uh, that almost seems like a paradox, but uh, that's what this piece uh, tends to be at some point. So that gives you an overview of each piece. Hi, welcome to Meet Space. Uh, this is coming to you from Northern Illinois University, care of the nice people at Art Zone. Uh, this is going to be a regular feature, um, hopefully to get people a little more accustomed to what it is that uh, video art is about. Um, my name's Jim. And I'm Devin. And tonight we'll be looking at a piece by Bart Woodstrup. And it's from 1992 and it's called Black Knight Calling. And uh, it addresses... Uh, several formal concerns right right and basically um how women how an artist can express himself through video i think we're probably better off just letting it uh speak for itself sure let's take a look okay right
Black night calling, here comes the light. Can't give up in the thick of the fight. Just want to thank her for letting us show her video uh, since she's in Mexico and didn't really, right. Can't really, really say so. so. Sure. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the, the video is full of a lot of really striking images that address the issues that she wants to talk about. Yeah, exactly, and um, not a, a single shot in it isn't wasted. There's no waste of time in the piece. I thought there was a great use of the, the soundtrack. The uh, Those are the kind of... Pizza guy. <laughs> pizza guys you'll always remember. Thanks for watching. Join us again next month for another edition of Meat Space. If you'd like to submit video art, please send it to 606 Sycamore Road, DeKalb, Illinois, 60115. We now return you to your regularly scheduled Art Zone. Well, thanks for watching the Art Zone. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Stop in and see us at J.R. Cortman Center for Design downtown at 107 North Main, or give us a call at 968 0123. Once again, thanks for watching The Art Zone. This is The Art Zone. This is The Art Zone. Frolic. Thanks for watching The Art Zone. If you would like to see past episodes of The Art Zone, they can be checked out at the downtown Rockford Public Library. Art Zone is funded by J.R. Cortman Center this for Design and zone. Cafe Esperanto, downtown Rockford. This is The Art Zone. 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 I wish I was as good a talker as you. Yeah, <laughs> you caught that, huh? <laughs> Shoots can't get by you. <laughs>